Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I never fully bought into the ball earth model because it it just didn't make sense to me when it was presented to me. Uh, It seems like everything's revolving around us. It seems like we're still and I can never see the curvature. And so in school, it felt like one of the first things I was being presented that didn't really make any sense. That's A, B, C, okay, I get it. One, two, three, gotcha. Like all of these kind of things make sense. But then when they start telling me about macro cosmological things that are bigger than my child brain can comprehend, and it seems really imaginative, and then you find out later on in life that, yeah, it is really imaginative. <laughs> that was a good intuition because in reality, the things you can actually sense, how you feel and what you can see, you're not moving. Nothing's curving. Everything's revolving around us. But in the what they're trying to tell us is basically the exact opposite of that. And it felt like a mind game sitting there. And I'm just like, OK, so OK, so I have to believe that the horizon, even though it's always straight, if it's far enough, it starts curving and it keeps curving all the way around into a circle. And there's people in Australia that live halfway around that circle and they're standing upside down. And when they jump, they return back upside down and there's buildings and planes flying upside down and everything. That was, to my young mind, the first point of contention. I was like, what? How is that possible? That doesn't even make any sense. And so you ask, raise your hand. Uh, how, how is that even possible? And, you know, the one word answer they they give, <laughs> I, I like to call it gravity because it just grabs everything apparently and holds it to the bottom of that spinning ball. And that's what the teacher told me is, uh, yeah, the gravity, the gravity grabs you and the oceans and it curves them all around the ball. And that's why it works. And, and that really did not make any more sense to me than the, <laughs> the thing to begin with. But um, that's how it worked in history, too, as they presented that model and that uh, Copernicus did. And then the next thing, well, Newton had to come along and justify how that could possibly happen with his concept of gravity. And so we've been going along with that for four or five hundred years now, even though it's completely against our common sense and experience. We're taught it at a young age like that. And most people, you, you, you can't really criticize things, even if it intuitively goes against your common sense like it did mine as a young child. So what do you do with stuff like that? It's almost like trauma. So what do you do with childhood trauma? Well, you kind of compartmentalize it. You forget about it for a while until you become of age to where I was 20, early 20s. And I started thinking about it again, how we're supposed to be spinning a thousand miles per hour and going 66,000 miles per hour around the sun and the sun goes 500,000 miles per hour around the galaxy and the galaxy's shooting away from a big bang at millions of miles more per hour, all in different directions. And I'm sitting there in a lotus pose, just like, really (laughs) and so i started looking into geocentrism which is the idea that the earth is still a ball uh but it was really i didn't even get into flat earth at first because that was my first adult inkling was man if the whether it's a ball or not i don't know but i really feel like i'm not moving i never felt like i'm moving like unless there's an earthquake earth is completely still and it makes no sense that we'd be going under all those motions. If we were, how could you have constellations? The night sky would be completely different every single night. You'd never be able to have all the fixed stars fixed together in their same relative positions for thousands of years, long enough that we could create myths about them and create little pictograms and name them and everything. No way. All the stars would just be in spirally random motions from all the random spinning they say we're doing. Yeah. It, so none of that makes any sense, of course. And so, yeah, I got into geocentrism first and I saw that there are a few people on the internet, very few, who were contending that the Earth is motionless and everything else is actually revolving around us and we are the center of the universe. And that's very different from uh, what uh, modern astronomers claim 
but it's actually exactly what all ancient philosophies and ancient religions and ancient holy books claim. You're not going to find a single holy scripture that says the earth is a tilting, wobbling, spinning space ball among millions and billions of other planets that were created by God. Nope. Earth is the special one at the middle of everything. And we're like center stage and the supposed planets, those were called throughout history, the wandering stars, the fixed stars or what we still call cars, stars in the constellations and the wandering stars because they have their own unique paths as they circle around a circling sun, which gives them retrograde and uh, forward motions. Um, they have their own kind of spirograph like flowery patterns that we've now called planets and the modern astronomers have claimed are these huge balls l like Earth, but most of them even bigger. Um, and, and now Earth is a planet too, instead of it being a plane, which it observably mm -hmm. and empirically is, they just add a T to the end of it and say, oh, see that up there, little Timmy, that little tiny dot, that's a, a physical terra firma as big as what we're standing on. Uh, yeah. And the light from it is so far away that we're actually just seeing the light from 20 minutes ago or, you know, longer than that, an hour ago, a year ago. That's what these light years are that they came up with to make everything infinitely distant from us so that we enter their realm of imagination where this crap all makes sense apparently because these things are so big but they're so far away so that's all we see it's just this little bit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For, so for me what what really um got me into like this distrust in science was and this was before i you know i saw your videos about flat earth um, I, I, t I had to take this class called Modern Physics, right? It, and it's it's the last of the physics series that we had to take. And Modern Physics is basically, th th in in my opinion, this is how I describe it. It's basically, okay, the, the first three physics courses we had to take are like classical physics, you know? And then, and then we take this fourth one, which is, in my opinion, it was like they figured everything out already and they're, they need to seem relevant. So then in order to maintain research funding and stuff, they start making shit up, you know, to seem like they're onto something that they right. never actually proved. Yeah. But uh, when, when they first told me about time dilation, you know, and, and the whole thing about time dilation is if, if you were to take off at the speed or near the speed of light at or near the speed of light, uh, and you were you were to go for like 10 years, right? When If you came back, when you come back 10 years later, everyone on earth would be 30 years older, you know, than, than you who only aged 10 years. And I'm like, okay, what? No, that's, that's <laughs> biological clock doesn't change based on how fast you're traveling, one. And two, how, how do they test this? Like, like the only thing that we have that can go at or near the speed of light is light, right? And then so what, what did you at, document the age of light and then send it out for 10 years? And then when it came back, you actually could identify this single photon and go, oh, wow, it's it only aged this much time. And we've all aged this. You know, it's like it's there's no way to possibly test that. But yet the, the book states it as fact. And what scares me is that every other student in that class was like, whoa, wow, this is amazing. You know, and I'm like, dude, none of you guys think this is a load of crap like this. There's 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 no way that this is like the case or there's no way to tell, you know, but then they, they based all their all this like physics off of that you know and it's just like dude there's no such thing as time dilation and then like another thing that always didn't sit with me well is the double slit experiment you know they're like they're like okay if you observe it it has these results right and it's like okay but then when you don't observe it it has a different results it's like okay or you mean when i don't observe it first of all an experiment if you don't observe an experiment you're not doing the experiment like <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, like, well, somewhere, some, somewhere, somehow, you know, this happened, but you know, we can't demonstrate it. And then uh, there's this, there's these things called, I guess they're called muons. It's like a some subatomic particle or something uh, that that rains on us, you know, all the time, right? And then uh, our professor in in the modern physics class has this little gas chamber. It's like a fish tank with, like, uh, like fog in it or something. And then you're supposed to be able to see the little particles go down, right? And then so he sets this up, right? And then and then uh, we're sitting through the whole course of the whole class, like the hour class, and and we didn't see a single particle go, right? 
And then he's like, yeah, if, if anybody's interested in checking this out after class, you can go ahead and stay, you know? So I was like, all right, I got to see this, dude, because I don't believe this shit, dude. Like, so I'm sitting there. I, I, I sat after class and I just watched the fucking uh, the little gas chamber thing for a whole nother hour. Like, just, and I tried not to blink, you know, I'm just sitting there just staring at it because I, I didn't want to miss it. And then to the point to where the next class came in and they had to clear out that classroom. So they had to move everything. And I was just like, oh, man. And I didn't see one. And then I'm watching some science doc or like lecture or whatever. And then the, the guy on the science lecture is like, and see, this will show you the, the particles. And then he's not able to demonstrate it. I'm like, wow, that's odd. So I sat there for two hours looking at that thing, didn't see one. And then th this guy on, on a documentary or, or lecture couldn't show, couldn't show a muon either, you know? And I'm just like, yes, yeah, see, it's, it's, and then when you read how many are supposed to be raining in our, in our atmosphere at all times, you know, and then what's what's funny too about that is that they, they say that they, they know that time dilation exists because the muon they, they go further than they're supposed to. They're all, they're supposed to stop at a certain point. They don't. They go further. So that means that like lengths contracted or time dilation. I'm like, no, no. Okay, first of all, they don't all go to the same point. First of all, you know, because unless they're all fired at the same from the same exact spot with the same trajectory. And speed, you know, at the same, you know, like it, it, there's no way that you know, you know how long it goes. It's like rather than to think, oh, if you go at the speed of light, time changes, you know, instead of making that heinous like assumption, you could s just say, oh, maybe we don't know exactly how long these things live, you know, they, some live different times than others or they're fired at different places, you know, there's never a consistent thing in nature. And like for me, I always, I always had a hard time with that. I was just like, dude, this is, this is just a load of crap, dude. You know, and and like I ended up acing the class just because I was so like not with it. You know, I was just like, this is so dumb. Like, what? How do how do you even make these assumptions? But um, one 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 quick thing I wanted to point out. Uh, I had I had this game, uh, Civilization Six or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it gives you quotes from famous people, and one of them is uh, it says, it says if if the if the facts don't don't fit the theory, change the facts. <laughs> right, and then, and then you know, you know, you know who said that? Albert Einstein. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm like, dude, and that's the quote that they show on the, on the game, and I was just like, if the facts don't fit the theory, change the facts. Like, like oh my god, dude, like, that's that's blatantly saying that, yeah, you know, oh, just, you got to change the universe because my theory is right, you know, <laughs> and it, that's pretty much what they're doing, you know, that's that's like what they're, you know, I don't I don't even know what they're trying to get at with time dilation like they don't even they can't even tr truly calculate the speed of light you know mm -hmm. um and and in in my honest opinion i don't think that light has to travel to get to us i think that as soon as it's on we see it exactly you know and and it's it's just it's just as that simple you know it's just that they've, they've driven us so far from that that we're just like no it has to travel and get here it's like no no it's just when it's on what you see in the sky is literally what's on right there if a star were to shut down it would just turn off mm-hmm you know, and I think I think it's just it just be instantaneous. You know, I don't think that uh, you know it has to travel distances. And for the fact that they think that that it, it's so far away that we're looking at it in the past, it's like, dude, there's never an image of anything cast uh, out just just from its light. You know, mm -hmm. the object is gone. It's gone. You know, it doesn't have a, a you know. Otherwise, you could follow the light. Well, first of all, there'd be light. It's like, it's like the kid uh, scared, uh, you know, turning the light off and trying to run before it it shuts <laughs> off. They're trying to say that that exists. That oh, really? everything is so imaginative, like that. What passes for science nowadays, most of it started as science fiction, uh, especially like you're saying the macro and micro cosmological stuff. Anything that's too small for you to see, or it's too big for to, to be empirically proven. It starts right. and ends in the realm of theory. And just like that quote said, if the facts don't fit it, well, they just keep going with the theory and bend it to, to suit uh, whichever direction they want it to go. And that's what's got us with ridiculous things like time dilation. And like we were talking about earlier, time itself as being a fourth dimension. They, you start and you piggyback on top of these things. So three dimensions of space makes sense. You know, you got height, uh, length, breadth, like you said, they're 90 degrees from each other. They're all spatial. And then you add time to it and act like that is a relevant fourth part of this equation when it's a whole new thing. And then once you've done that, now we can bend space time. Space time becomes a thing. It's a, it's a one thing. You've got to hyphenate it now. 
and then space time becomes bent and then time becomes dilated and like you said now you can if you travel fast enough you can come back and you'll be younger than everybody else wow new anti-aging remedy by einstein and and it's again these are all in the realm of science fiction and most of these things have been dreamed of by arthur c clark and isaac asimov and actual science fiction writers before oh. <laughs> just decade or or less before they claim to have discovered the exact same thing in reality like satellites for example they science fiction writers come up with these things create worlds in which they exist and then the manipulators of our world uh, pedestalize these things and put them in the, the you know, propaganda machine and make us think that they're real things. Uh, and they've done that with relativity, time dilation, uh, time as a fourth dimension, you name it, uh, the, the double slit experiment, like you were saying. Yeah. Um, there's so many, oh, the bilocation that you were talking about. Oh, I yeah. had the same problem with these things. There are all these crazy thought experiments that I would sit there, you know, reading the physics books and just trying to comprehend how can the same thing exist in two places? It's not, it can't be the same thing anymore. You at least, you created two of this, it's like a twin. They're exactly the same. They have the same fingerprints. Every single thing about them is the same. They move in the same ways at the same time. Well, now they're two different robots then. Whatever it is, they're two different things. No, but then they come back together as one thing. Well, now they're one thing. It, it, regardless of how you conceptualize it, it, it can't be one thing existing in two places. It's no. like, a, you know, you're, you're changing what it is to be spatial or what it is to be singular at that point. It's such a mind fuck that, it, like, like you said, you can now just go anywhere. Once you accept a faulty premise, you can create a whole world of lies based on it. And those whole world of lies can be completely consistent. They can be mathematically verified. It's, yeah, but, right. but if you don't know where that one little pinhole is that was the problem that everything was based on, you may never get to the foundation of all those lies, which is what's happened with modern science. People don't know where the foundation, I'll tell you what the foundation is, the flat earth. That's the foundation. That's the literal foundation that's been removed from everyone. It's been, you know, balled up and spun around the sun. So, and along with everyone's imaginations, which are now all balled up and spun around the sun, thinking that we're moving in all those directions I talked about earlier. And if you believe that, well, now you can believe anything because you are like, you know, you're believing in imaginative things. It's no longer empirical. It's no longer direct realism. You no longer trust your senses. You, you no longer trust your common sense and experience. You trust authorities. You yeah. trust the the magic white coat magicians that told you all their big numbers and highfalutin theories when you were five years old or ten years old when you couldn't really combat them. And you were and things like appeal to authority really worked on you then. And now you've got like Stockholm syndrome for these authority figures, and yeah. you don't you don't want to admit that maybe you don't know anything, your teachers didn't know anything, these authority figures didn't know anything, and the reality is something you have to start completely bare bones all over again like a child and say, hmm, what if the earth isn't a ball spinning around the sun like they told me? Most people can't even do that. They can't even bring themselves back to a state of what if. Uh -huh. What if that's possible? No, nope, they already know. They're, they're so sure. It's the same with most religious people. And that's why the globe religion is the most successful and widely believed religion in the world, because nobody even knows it's a religion. They think right, it's right. science with yeah, a capital yeah. S. You, you know, you know, it's um, what's crazy. Like there's a whole bunch of like contradictory things. Like if you have a mass on a tether, you know, like you have a string tied to a ball and you spin it. Right. It's, it's a physical fact that when you let go of the, the tether, the, the ball shoots off in a in a straight line path uh, tangent to the circle wherever you mm. let go. You know. Right. Yep. And then they, they taught us that in in the physics classes. Right. And then so so it's like, OK, if and that's that's true 100 percent of the time with 100 percent. You can you can even try it yourself, you know, get as big or small as a mass as you want. You swing it around, you let go. It's it's always going to go in a straight line once you let go. It's nothing's going to cause it to continue orbiting. And yet, with that being a hundred percent 
true in every experiment, then for them to say that the Earth orbits, you know, it's like, wait, wait, orbits, we, we just, they just said how a tethered object is the only way that it's going to go around. And and as soon as you let go, you know, it, it goes. So how is the Earth not a, a non-tethered object to the sun, you know? And, and it, it should go in a straight line, you know, and then they say objects moving in a straight line in a frictionless environment will continue to move in a straight line, you know. But then they say, oh, well, you know, they, they don't add in the fact that it's like, well, no, supposedly they'll move in a straight line. But if there's any other mass in that vicinity, they'll all they'll converge to, to each other and then one will start spinning around or or whatever. And like I even have these spherical magnets. Right. And I had this little tray. And I, I would have one sitting there, and I would just throw a magnet, just try to, to try to make it orbit. It never does, not once, not even close. As soon as the they get close enough to where they have an attraction to one another, they just smack together, and then and then the whole thing spins. But they're stuck together. You can't you can't get it to curve and then continue curving at all. You know, it's either it's either not in the field or it is, and they both hit together. And it's just like, dude, so because that's my example of like an attractive force, you know, causing orbit. It doesn't cause orbit. You know, um, and it, that's the other thing, too, that nothing orbits. You can't you can't get if because the, the big thing about gravity is not just that we attract to the Earth or whatever. Their claim is that all matter attracts all other matter indefinitely. Mm-hmm. And it's like, OK, really, you, you think all matter attracts. So any bit of matter that I have is attracted to any other bit of matter. Like wouldn't we have like clumps of gases, you know, like forming big balls of gas that just like, you know, Hang together, or like, for instance, if you if you exit a spaceship in space, right, and you have air, should, shouldn't the air just kind of float around you as you leave? So you don't really even need a, like a breathing apparatus. You just go outside; the air will stick to you. Then when you breathe the carbon dioxide out, it'll just come right back, and right. you'd have this atmosphere around you. You know, right. it's it's nonsense. And like things, gases, liquids, and solids don't when you when you shoot them through any type of like medium, they don't all travel at the same rate. You, you know, like, like, that's why, like, for instance, when you, you know, when you shoot like a, or like, if it's harder to throw a little styrofoam ball further than it is to throw like a baseball, you know, and it's, and it's just because of the, the, what they call it inertia. I was never quite solid on like what exactly is inertia, but they, they say, you know, it's because of the inertia, right? But it's like, like, if that's the case, then you can't have a, a ball and I mean, uh, or a solid object and then a liquid and then a gas floating around it, you know? Like the, the just the fact that I, I looked at all the levels of impossibilities that the the ball Earth uh, has to violate. Like first of all, okay, this a sphere is the only shape that can't hold any water. Every other surface, every other shape has some type of flat surface that you can orient it and put some water on top of it. You know, the, the sphere is the only object that you can't that it 100% can't hold water. You know, it's the only shape that can't. And then you take that and then you spin it, and when you spin an object, it repels water. You know, so it's like it, then, then you spin it. So that makes it even less likely to hold water. But it does anyways. Then to make it orbit, nothing orbits because, you know, untethered objects will move in a straight line. And then and then so then you have it go around there. And then the, the speed of 66,000 miles per hour, 66,600 miles per hour. That's 32 times faster than a rail gun, which is the, the fastest solid projectile ever shot by man. Like the the the. The, the rail gun holds the record for the fastest solid object, you know, that we've ever made as a species, faster than anything we've ever sent in as a solid. And and the Earth is going 32 times faster than that. Like, you know how much faster something is if it's twice as fast? Like, like for instance, uh, uh, I calculated a jet isn't even 32 times faster than a golf cart. L- like a military jet, it's, that's mm. not even 32 times faster than a golf cart. It's, it's way less. I think it was somewhere on the order of like 17 times or something like that, you know? So, so, uh, the, the rail gun, if you were to be stationary in space and the earth was whizzing by and you shot the rail gun, the earth would smoke it by so, so bad that it wouldn't even be almost a competition, you know? Mm-hmm. It's just like, you know, and then the rail gun would just be like, <laughs> right. it's like, and then when you look at the projectiles of a rail gun, you can't even see it. You just see like a swoosh through the air, right. you know? And, you, and it's just like, okay, and the earth is going, 32 times faster than that that's so much faster than that rail gun and then you think you think life can form on that rail gun even if you shot it in the vacuum of space you think life and bacteria is going to live and grow and stick to that like right. just the fact that you you need to physically mount things to moving objects you know otherwise they fling off you know but you mm-hmm. think that little life forms and flies are just going to be hanging on to that that object just going you know 
32 times faster than a rail gun. You think that like, like as far as a biological standpoint, like do you, or like from a biology standard, like do you, do you think life can form under that, ex, those extreme forces of something moving that fast? And then they're like, oh, well, it's, it's constant. So you don't feel it, but that's only in a straight line. Like they, they say that you don't really feel constant speed as long as there's no acceleration, but turning is a, is a form of acceleration. Spinning is a form of acceleration. They're all changes in direction, which is a, a change in acceleration. Right. So circular motion is constant acceleration in a new vector ever, all the time. That's yeah. how it's defined. So all circular motion is constant acceleration anyway. And they've got three other motions to contend with around the sun, around the galaxy, and the galaxy around the universe, which are all going in, in different types of directions. So, you know, yeah. based on their own logic, no, we should feel, observe, experience, be able to see all of that. And they're right. claiming, no, no, it's it, because you were born with it. So even though you're going 32 times faster than a bullet, <laughs> no, you can't see it. And you can't, you feel like you're totally still. And, but, you know, and it's all going in one, in a westerly direction, but you can feel a one mile per hour easterly breeze pass by you, but you'll yeah. never experience this, this speed. Right? They want us to think that our senses are ridiculously dumbed down to all their macro cosmological nonsense, but completely, you know, working to the degree that we can observe most minute uh, wind passing by us or, uh, you know, a, a slight earth tremor we can feel and all these things, but we'll never in your entire life will anyone in all of history ever feel or observe the motion of the earth. It's just so perfect. Yeah, yeah. And it's and it's like, okay, I've calculated the, the speed of the earth around the sun is Mach 98.7. <laughs> so, so the world record, I think, for the the fastest Bach that that a person has gone in a jet, I oh man, I, I don't want to, I don't want to get the number wrong, but it was somewhere in like, it, I want to say sixteen or something like that. But the, the average person passes out at like three or like you know, probably two. Uh, jet pilots usually, I think, they go to like six or seven, but and then the world record was like I think sixteen or something like that. Now, now we're talking, and this is when they they pass out, you know, because the blood rushes to their, to the back of their head or whatever, you know, and they pass out. So that that's a, say sixty. That's with it's under twenty for sure. And then the Earth is going Mach ninety eight point seven around the sun. Like like oh okay right. So so for some reason on this Earth that's moving that fast. If we go Mach six, we pass out. But then, but we're already going Mach ninety eight point seven. Yeah. You know. And, <laughs> And then to make matters worse, it's spinning. You know, if if that that adds even more acceleration. You know, you don't have to spin. Like we're just talking about just going around. You know, it's it's bad enough, but spinning makes it even worse. Like that, then you definitely would feel it. You know, like no, I mean, you definitely would have felt it anyways. There's no way not to feel that that extreme of emotion. In mm -hmm. fact, we we would be crushed to the to the like if you're in the front of the ball and it's going that fast, you 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 smash into the surface of the earth. It's going forward at you like that. You know, like like our bones, our brittle bodies can't handle forces that uh, Mach 98. You know, because if, if at Mach 6 or whatever, our blood goes back and we pass out, at Mach 98, our bones would probably shatter and our, our heart would, like, flatten, you know? Mm. And it's just, like, it's it's crazy. And then one, one thing that really bothers me is, like, the whole um, the moon orbiting the Earth, you know? Like how when the moon is in front of the Earth, right, gravity should be pushing them apart in order to maintain a constant distance around you know, to be consistently a certain uh, distance away from the Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, when, the, when the moon is in front of the Earth, it should the gravity should be repelling the moon because the moon would want to just smack together, you know, with the Earth when it's when it's in, in its way. But then as it as it swoops around back, then gravity would, would need to pull the moon as fast as the Earth is going, plus more for the moon to slingshot in front of it, mm -hmm. you know? And, and then all of a sudden, then gravity would have to repel you know push it back so they stay because in order to maintain a constant distance you'd have to have a push pull push pull push pull you know thing and it's like they don't they never mention that and then the fact that they say the moon controls the tides by pulling the water here and then it makes a bulge over on this side that's why we have two tides every day it's like no it's not if, if the moon were pulling it would make like a kind of like a teardrop you know where, where the tip is going towards the moon you know at all mm -hmm. times it, it wouldn't form a bulge on both sides of the earth or the the pair or whatever it is you know um and it's just it's it's such nonsense it's like dude there's there's no way and then oh what i was getting at with the whole matter attracting all other matter right like to have to show that that that's such an immense task like you'd have such a 
hard time having to show that all matter attracts all other matter. You know, it's like that's what they claim. And it's like, no, no, it doesn't. You know, and they so, can't even show a single example of any piece of matter that we can work with that's large enough to attract even a dust bunny. You know, the the Epcot, you know, what, that big Epcot golf ball thing that can't cause a regular golf ball to be sucked to it or orbit around it. You know what I mean? We don't have a single structure on Earth big enough to even cause the smallest mass you can think of, like a, a dust mi- a bunny or something, to orbit around it or to be drawn to it, you know, mysteriously. Oh, look, look, the look at the Eiffel Tower. There's a there's a dust bunny slowly being drawn towards it get this on yeah. film it's it's the gravity hey wait look there's there's a dandelion seed that's starting to oh wait there's a feather there's a feather from a bird that just flew off and it's starting to draw to the eiffel tower look at this no, right there's not a single thing it, ever that does no. this but but people believe that everything in reality is working this way right no we, we don't need examples anymore science doesn't yeah. need need experiments anymore science is whatever the science fiction writers say and the teachers uh teach us you know we're we're like little sheep people don't ask the kind of questions you're asking the kind of uh, thought experiments you're doing within their logic most people yeah. don't do that they just they just take what they say at face value and they say okay. like you said earlier they're just whoa time dilation wow you mean if i go fast enough i can get younger I'm amazing they, yeah. they just it's the same with entertainment you know when people just sit back and then like, like the most unrealistic action sequence or the most unrealistic dramatic sequence happens and they're just like oh tear or oh my god edge of my seat suspense uh, but the those of us who are more questioning would be like what what is this movie do you guys do you like this <laughs> you're entertained by this and it's the same thing with the the education you know we're, we're they're being taught this as if it's real and we're looking around like you guys are buying this 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 makes sense to you guys what <laughs> You're going, wow, you're you're astonished by this? I'm only astonished by the fact that you're all astonished by this like it's real. Like, what? What is happening yeah. right now? That was that, wasn't that like the majority of your education <laughs> as uh, far as as far as these kind of subjects, like I said earlier, like math, I get it. Reading, I get it. You know, uh, things that you can taste, touch, feel that make sense to you is fine. But when you get into these imaginative realms of micro and macrocosms and claiming that this is the only way like the heliocentric cosmology is set in stone they don't even present flat earth or geocentric or other cosmologies as an option they're just like no no little jimmy here is everything on a plate for you it's all been figured out hundreds of years ago by these super smart people and don't question anything and most most people are wired that way to not question anything and then if they hear somebody questioning anything they're wired to think you're crazy. Do you hear this crazy guy? He thinks he's smarter than the smartest people in history. Who is he to ask questions? <laughs> right. And, and th- this is where I was getting at with uh, you, you said you studied philosophy and mm-hmm. I, 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 t- I took a philosophy course. And the, the thing, the logic um, that you guys do, like with the truth tables and you simplify a statement, you know, with the with the logical uh, I forgot what it's called, lo- logical proofs or something. Uh, th- that's what computer science is like. I, that's it's the same thing we were. I was doing in my computer science classes with binary. Just we have different symbols for everything, you know. Like like for uh, and it's a uh, it's whereas um, oh man, I forgot I forgot what like we would use like an ampersand or like a multiply and a plus. Whereas mm-hmm. in in philosophy they use is it, is it the ampersand or the vertical line or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but they they just use different symbols. And what's funny is that the philosophy problems were actually harder. Than the computer science ones, you know, because because you, you guys get way complex with them, you know, and then and then there's a certain rules to to simplify them. But uh, the thing is though about philosophy is, is I felt that it teaches you how to evaluate information. You know, it teaches you how to think necessarily. And what you're doing is you're you're applying your philosophical mindset to fields of science that it's if something doesn't like like for instance if there's a counterclaim to something, you know, or like a contradiction, then it discredits the whole claim. You know, you just have one contradiction and that's enough to say that, no, that's not always true, mm-hmm. you know? And so you don't need to know the entire the entirety of the mm-hmm. false claim in order to see that it's not true. You just need to know one contradiction. And then the, the statement is no longer true, you know? And like that's what I was learning in philosophy. And I'm just like, yeah, that's that's why 
all the, you notice how a lot of the ancient scholars and stuff were they're all philosophers you know there is like they studied philosophy and mathematics or and this but they were all philosophers because that is the subject that it's it that teaches you how to critically analyze you know and and not just you know it's true because the authoritative you know like like someone in a higher authority told says it's true that doesn't make it true mm-hmm. you know that's and one of the many uh, fallacies of formal logic that you learn in philosophy is yeah. appeal appeal to authority yeah and like yeah. you said with this subject that is the main thing that people are doing is they're just not understanding that an appeal to these historical authority figures or appeals to your textbook or appeals to your science teacher or whoever or neil degrasse tyson or whoever it is these people are just figureheads for a theoretical system and that has no bearing on its actual um uh wh- whether it's actually true or false those things all happen in the realm of logic, which is where you derive uh, conclusions from premises. And if anywhere along the line of your uh, logic, the premises don't follow from one another, then your, your statement is illogical and doesn't follow. And that, that's what all of formal logic is based on. And it's, a bit, like you said, it's a bit more complex than uh, when you're doing computer stuff because you have grammar involved. And the grammar is what can get uh, people tripped up. If you don't state exactly your parameters, um, you can have a single word can change the whole meaning of a logical um, equation. And, okay. and and if people aren't catching that one word, the whole it's similar to a math math equation. Just one number or one symbol out of place changes the entire thing. And if yeah. that's what you're using as a truth claim, like a lot of people use, they think math. Like if something works up mathematically, then that means it's true. But math is just a language, just like English or anything else. And it's a it's symbols. It's a symbolic thing for standing for something else. The thing in itself is what's real, meaning what you can observe, touch, taste, feel. That's what you can experiment and, and with and what is real. An equation on a piece of paper that's trying to represent that reality that can be manipulated. And even if that's internally completely consistent, it doesn't mean it's relevant to whatever real life thing you're trying to apply it to. And that's the whole thing with the heliocentric math. Yeah, their math works, but it doesn't apply to the actual reality that we're living in. Yeah, math is just a language. Okay, the the whole purpose of math is just to count. That's all it is. It's just it's just fancy ways of counting. You know, when you break it down to its bare essentials, yeah, like, for instance, I learned all this electrical engineering math, right? And then when I, I went to apply it the other day to a simple circuit that I was making, right? And then the math is way off. Like, it's, it's not that I was doing it wrong. It's just that the level of precision is off because math can only describe the universe to a certain degree of precision, but it never quite gets it right, you know? And like in all these physics classes, they always say, okay, uh, ignore wind resistance. Okay, wind resistance is the, the the main force when you're in motion, you know, that's really acting against something. Yeah, or it's, it's not... It's it's the main source of friction, you know, that that's gonna go against the force. So if you're doing a calculation and you're and you're omitting uh, air resistance, that that's that's not even the real thing, you know. You're not looking at the real world anymore, you know. And like all these math equations that they swear like like accurately calculate the the world, it, they don't really. They only do to a certain degree. But you, oh, this is what I was gonna say. Um, something that's been tripping me out recently is that I realized one day that you can't multiply unlike terms. You know, like like if you can't say five apples times five oranges, you know, because then you get 25 apple oranges. But an mm-hmm. apple orange is not a real thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I realize that the only thing that you can do is divide like miles per hour. You know, you, and all you're all you're doing is you're, you're just saying how many how much of this unit goes by after how much of this unit goes by. Mm-hmm. You know, and if there's any relationship between them. But other than that, you can't multiply it unlike things. You know, so in order to. Or just like how you can't add, uh, you can't add unlike things either. Like five oranges plus five apples equals what? It it doesn't equal anything because there's there's no no thing that combines the two. Right. You know, it, yeah, you know what I'm saying. So totally, I've even taken it philosophically further than that because yeah. the, the, you know we classify things into say let's go with pine trees and Macintosh apples. Okay. Yeah. But then you just got trees and apples. Now, what classifies something as an apple versus a non-apple or a Macintosh apple versus a non-Macintosh apple or a tree versus a non-tree or a pine tree versus a non-pine tree? 
because there's so many, and the same with animals and every other variation of things that are in existence, there's so many degrees between them that there are things that are kind of like a half a pine, a half a spruce, and it might have a, a, another name. And the classification becomes very uh, dim because of the fact that no two pine trees are exactly the same. Just like no two humans with their fingerprints or anything are exactly the same. And right. no two anything in existence are exactly the same. So even right. a, as something as simple as a rock, which all look totally different and whatever, but you know, at some point the rock may become uh, sand or or dirt or glass or something else. And some rocks are more of that substance than another. And so everything is, you know, shades of gray. But language, yeah. language requires everything to be black and white, or else you can't talk about it. But the big ineffable thing is the one thing in existence that is always happening which includes literally everything. And, and when you start to say one human, like there's two humans talking right now, or I pick up this apple and that apple, and now it's, there's two apples. Well, those two things are not the same thing. It's like the bilocation thing we were talking about earlier. Right. You're trying to say that, that Vahid and Eric are two of the same thing. Well, what is that? We're two totally different things. Or these two apples, well, they're shaped different. They have, you know, there's so many slight variations between the two things, no matter how you try to classify them, that the only totally honest, totally accurate thing that can be in existence is everything. But right. now we can't talk. Yeah. Now yeah. we can't live. Now we can't even do anything. But the point yeah. is, like I was saying earlier, if you get to the very bottom fundamental problem of something and poke a hole in it, suddenly that whole world of lies falls apart. And for me, it's all of mathematics and all of language at that point, because there are no two things. Everything literally is one. And we try to conceptually separate everything into two humans, two apples, two trees. Oh, this is a pine tree. Well, that's a spruce tree. Oh, okay. Oh, and this is a, and they keep going. And there is no end to that. If you keep trying to divide and, and take a microscope to nature and try to see how things compare and contrast, you can keep labeling until the cows come home. There is no, it's infinite. Or, so it's an infinite regress in that direction, or you bring it back to what I'm saying, which is oneness. Everything right. is one, and that's all there is. That's the fundamental reality we're living in, and all math and all language is just trying to make a black and white thing out of this infinite shade of gray that we all exist in. Right, that, no, that's true, because either either we don't exist or we do so we we're assuming that we do exist because we have you know sensor sensors and like you know we can feel things and see things so something is in existence yeah you're right so it's either everything is in existence or nothing is but it, it's obviously not nothing i mean well i mean as far as we can tell it's enough it's not nothing you know so it's yeah you're right i never thought of that you're right it's it's all it's all one yeah the entire existence then that kind of goes back to my whole um take on how there's no such thing as time it's just different configurations of matter you know because remember when i was that, that point i was making with the with the graph it's just a point it's not a line you know but they just map all the points to make the line well uh, it's only a point well so is everything in existence it's just the point in which the matter is like the location where the matter is and then the matter moves because of forces right but then we're, we're just trying to make reference to this configuration of matter as opposed to this configuration of matter now you know, as opposed to this one, and we're just trying to keep a record. But one one thing that I've heard that was really um, informative was that uh, time only deals with hypotheticals. When you when you're using time, you're talking about either the past, which is doesn't exist anymore, but you know, and and so it's a hypothetical, or you're talking about the future, which is a hypothetical and doesn't exist either. So time is in in and of itself is just a measure of a hypothetical system. You're only you time is never used to describe anything in the current present right now moment in fact time can't even measure the current moment because it's infinitesimally small you know and so so time only deals with hypotheticals and so therefore it, it in its in and of itself is a hypothetical you know and, <laughs> right. and it's definitely not a real physical thing you know yeah yeah, yeah. It's it's just like spiritually it, speaking as well right i mean yeah. scientifically speaking they've got us out there worrying about the uh, past and future that doesn't actually exist 
And then in, in your own life, you end up spending all of this time worrying about the future to be able to survive and how to do everything. All of modern society is basically trying to take you out of the present moment and put you into a state of past and future future longing and past sentimentality. Um, and to get out of that, both in the, your scientific world and the spiritual world, the present moment is the only thing that actually exists. And it's immeasurable, like you're saying. Again, the second you try to take a microscope to reality, whether it be spatial reality or now, like you're saying, temporal reality, which they try to claim is all one in itself, space time, uh, you find out that it's fake. There yeah, is no, yeah. all of space is one and all things in it, we're all one. And then all of time is also one. There is no flow or arrow, past or future. Every no. time that has ever existed and will ever exist is this one ineffable moment that we're all part of and it just keeps on going and it is as it is. There is no, oh, oh, it's, the now is the future. It's like we were talking about earlier with the kid trying to shut out the light and then run before the dark darkness comes. Yeah. The conception of the speed of light before they had a speed was that it was either on or off, just like you right. said. That's how it always used to be. This idea that it has some huge speed that we can outrun if we go fast enough and then we'll get younger. <laughs> that, no. that never existed before because it makes no sense and it's nowhere apparent nor yeah. could you experiment on it on anything to to prove such a crazy theory right and you, you know what's funny too is uh I, einstein had one one proof of the time dilation which is uh say, say you have a uh, you have like a, a mechanism where you shine a laser to a mirror and, and it's just a, it's just a pulse of light and it goes bing bing and it bounces back and forth First of all, if light was was a particle, it would it would bounce back and forth like that. But you can't you can't have the little fragment of light just bouncing back and forth. So just to begin with, it's already off, you know, out of whack. But uh, he says, okay, so you have this device that shoots light as a mirror and it bounces back and forth, right? Mm. And then if you move it uh, horizontally, right now it's going like this, right? And then because now if you trace its path, it's making a zigzag. Right. It's 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 actually going a way further distance than when than the one that's just going up and down at the same rate, because if you have the one just going up and down, but then this one starts moving, mm -hmm. it, it, the, the one that's moving went so much further. So that means the time uh, is it's it's uh, or the light is actually traveling through time because it's going a further distance in the same amount of time. But, and, I, and I'm like, wait, wait, hold on. No, no. It's vertical component going up and down is still the same, you know. And if, whether it's moving or not like this, you know, it's just that this one's moving. You're moving the entire system this way. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter, you know, as as to you keeping it there. They're still both just going up and down. That's it. You know, it's not that the light is going diagonal and this way and that way, because like, like I said, there's only the current present moment. So it's only a dot at any given time mm -hmm. and it's going up and down relative to the thing. And then you're just moving the thing, you know, but but they, they try to say that that's the proof that that light travels, you know, or bends or you know, manipulates time to move and it's like no it doesn't you know mm. and then even even with vertical components of like trajectories like if you throw a basketball you know uh the it'll or like when you throw something forward and then and you just drop something they, they both hit at the same time you know like the one that's flying this way and then the thing that's just dropping from stationary they, they both will hit the ground at the same time just one will travel way over here and then hit you know if you throw it and so what they say is that the vertical components remains the same. You know, it's not affected by the horizontal component. And then so you have something like that. And it's like that's that's a known fact that they, they demonstrate. And then and then to have that and then to say that, oh, but the light is actually going, you know, in this giant zigzag. It's like that you didn't prove anything, you know. And every single person in my class was just like, oh, wow, that's so amazing. I was just like, dude, not I was the only person that was just like, uh, no. Uh, this doesn't that doesn't make sense you know and it contradicts other physics you know and i don't I don't understand why other physicists don't get mad about this you know like the tethered mass you know it's like that automatically should have been a big red flag and they're like no i guess it's a bend in space time you know it's just like no no it's not you know um oh yeah uh you mentioned the 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 or we were talking about the past and the future you know that, that that's the other area of science where when you can't perceive it they start lying because they, they start lying when it's too big in cosmology, too small, like quantum physics, and then back in time where we can't go, they start lying about history, and then they, they lie about the projected future. Totally. You know? 
for like fear tactics and war and, and like, oh, they're going to attack. So we need to, you know, like, like that kind of shit. So it's, those are all the possibilities. There's no other, I don't think that there's any other realm that you can not see except for spirituality where they don't, they don't, they just say it doesn't exist. <laughs> Right. You know, it's like, okay, so 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 the one area that that most likely does exist out of all those, you know, the other the other ones are just hypotheticals or theoretical. The spiritual realm, you know, they have no explanation for what the fact that the fact that we move, you know, contradicts all of physics. You know, objects don't just move by themselves. You know, mm. something is moving them, but it's not something in the physical realm because a rock just sitting stationary is not going to like just get up and like start moving for whatever reason. You know. Mm -hmm. until you in insert something that's with uh, unless it's hit with like a force right but the thing is though uh, we're moving around you know and we're not i'm not hit by a force while i'm moving around you know it's it's that uh i'm i'm consciously moving it so this conscious energy somehow moves physical matter you know so which means that that the one i would say that is that is the dominant force or like the primary force is whatever this conscious energy is that's moving inanimate objects and making them move, you know, and perceive even, you know, and then, and then it's, it's like, so it's not something in the physical world, you know, you don't, you don't just have, you know, you don't have stationary objects, physics never studies objects that then get up and move by themselves, you know, they, they just study that, oh, well, force will move things, yeah, in the physical world, but something is beyond that is, is making us move, the fact that we're alive, so that there has to be some type of spiritual or conscious energy you know, but whatever it is, but it, 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 and it dictates the physical world. Right. And the whole big bang evolution paradigm is trying to remove that from yeah. being necessary in existence. It's trying to say that, uh, all of motion came from this explosion that happened for no reason out of nothing. And then all these physical things came together so that particles came together, forming planets and then water and, and gases formed atmosphere and eventually life started forming in single cells and, and dividing into multi cells and and going into, you know, fish. And then they they, they come crawl up onto land somehow without dying and grow. Right. grow yeah. They, they, and then they lay, you know, reptiles turn into mammals somehow within a single generation without dying and things go from needing gills to needing lungs in a single generation without dying like all these impossible macro evolution steps they say uh take place until we, they come to us the the uh, most complex thing in existence and throughout all that uh consciousness and the beauty and diversity and complexity of nature and like you're saying actual uh agency self-agency just comes so at first it was all these physical collisions causing all these chemical things to come into existence and then just the right chemical combination in the primordial soup created life and now ever since life each individual unit of life has its own agency it's and it is and soon brains come along and now we can uh, have complex thinking and and all our motor skills are linked to that no longer linked to the random explosion the physical thing that's not god that's not spiritual in any way that created everything but now we at our center we all now have this weird spiritual thing that causes us to have agency in this godless universe and we, we're able to question all of the, these things and wonder about uh, god and think about the past and the future and have these people relate these stories to us that we believe about the past and the future Whereas if we just sit, close our eyes in the present moment long enough, like say the Buddha did, you're going to see the entire physical world disappear. You know, if you can go into a cave, say, or whatever, they, they try to, uh, or even in the pyramids, in the what they now call the tombs, I think they, these were the same as the old Mithraic temples where they were um, actually, uh, what would you call it? They were tubs that you'd fill with salt water and they're sensory deprivation chambers. So in there, when you're, the water's at room temperature and you're floating, so you have no feel. And then it's complete darkness in there. So you have no sight and it's auditory sensation. There's none, it's totally quiet in there. And so you're just by yourself, with yourself. This is the kind of spirituality that is now gone from the world. Who does this? We're so entertained and distracted the, the idea of complete sensory deprivation for days on end 
who does that? I, I've wanted to do this for years, and I still haven't even done it. It's such a, right. it's such a, um, you know, an ascetic leap, especially in modern times, to to do such a thing. But uh, this was a regular practice in ancient times. People were leaving their bodies, astrally traveling to other realms, and they claimed this was the way to do it. I don't know if it gets to that level or not, but I can imagine that if you shut out all sensory perception for long enough, everything you think you know about the physical world is going to disappear, and you'll probably enter states of consciousness that we only have language to talk about them. We would call them dreams, but they're probably not dreams, and there's probably so many things that we call dreams, and we only have that one word for them, that aren't dreams. For example, I've had what you'd call prophetic dreams, like 20 probably times in my life, I have dreamt an exact situation that then happens in my life later. Yeah, and this, yeah. This really gets, you talk about time dilation and everything, this yeah. really gets into the whole nature of what time and, and what we're living in is, because for me, I have personal experience of viewing my own life before it happens. And yeah. so in a dream, over and over again. And I've even confirmed it in real time and shocked the person <laughs> that I was standing with when I said the exact next sentence that they were going to say along with them. Oh, whoa. And so <laughs> that pulled me right out of the moment because that didn't happen in my, my version. But that's so interesting. It's like, what is the future? Especially when I can dream it and either make it happen or not. It's like this crystallization yeah. of possibilities that our consciousness through our will and whether you know whether we want to go left or right flip a coin heads or tails is going to ultimately determine um the the crystallization of our lives i think it seems to work in right. in some way like that but it's way more mystical than just a single arrow of time that the the current paradigm tries to say